Hello all, Rick here again with a weekly look into Star Trek Discovery, episode 13, what's past is prologue. So let's analyse and review out of this one as a heck of a lot went on during this episode, and it definitely reshapes the status quo going forwards. Well for starters, the title itself sounds like an admission from the creators that what's come before has not been anything like the Star Trek that we know, and at its core, kind of right. But now that Lorca has gone? The past 13 episodes can now serve as a prologue to platform a series closer to the Federation ideals that take more of a centre stage in the other branches of Trek. Also I would like to rectify something from the previous reviews. I don't watch other reviews or read articles until I've scripted mine so as not to colour my opinion and as such of course I'm going to miss things or make mistakes. Basically I believed that the two Stamets may have switched bodies when returning from the Mycelial Network, however this was not the case. The idea was from the way the show edited from Prime Stamets in the network to Mirror Stamets waking up, but as this episode made clear, this wasn't the case. Which was just as well, I think, as I described the potential switch as confusing with everything seemingly building to the head. It would have been another rogue element to introduce so late on. So apologies for that. Anyway, after a one year and 212 days of terror and punishment, Lorca's followers were set free and suddenly... Gabriel Lorca has gone from prisoner at the Empire's mercy to being on the Emperor's doorstep with a small army while she is still distracted dealing with Burnham. It was a risky move to pull off, and I'll admit I am dubious as to how he managed to secure weapons and reach his crew without being detained on such an important vessel as the ISS Karen. But alright then. It seems now the facade has dropped and Lorca is elated that things have worked out so well for him. It reinforces his belief in destiny and that he cannot lose after everything he's endured, and he rides this high right throughout the episode. Also, Mira Landry is still Lorca's right hand and is basically normal Landry plus murder. They make a beeline for Mira Stamets, who had sold out their rebellion in the making, while Lorca was on Pryor's world recruiting for his cause. This is when the Karen rocked up in orbit and began assaulting the ISS Baran. Returning to the ship, a transporter accident caused by weapons fire and an ion storm, the same phenomena that caused the crossover events in TOS episode Mirror Mirror, causes him to jump realities. So let's look at the timeline then, shall we? The Battle of the Binary Stars marks the beginning of the Federation Klingon War and that was on May 11th, 2256. The USS Baran was destroyed about a month into the war, so let's call this sometime mid to late June 2256. November saw the USS Discovery conscript Michael Burnham and at this point Lorca had already been replaced by his mirror counterpart. This episode itself must take place early on in the year 2257 as the episode 6 of Magic to Make the Sanest Man Go Mad occurs late December 2256. Although the dates aren't exactly known yet, this means that if Lorca transferred to the Prime Reality one year and 212 days ago, he would have been in command of the USS Baran when it was self-destructed, and even for some time before that. Though until we get a dedicated timeline however, this is speculation that presumes that Lorca's crossing and the capture of Landry occurred at the same time. Anyway, Mira Stamets deploys a poison bioweapon that he's been working on to thin the Emperor's personnel out. I find the statement that destroying the mycelial network would end all life across the multiverse to be a bit out of nowhere. Maybe I missed something, but I didn't realise the uh, apparent vast importance of this network in keeping the universe teeming with life. Not quite sure I'd buy it either, but from a narrative standpoint the stakes were already high enough without the whole save the universe angle. So unsurprisingly Lorca's goal this whole time has been to overthrow the Emperor and replace her, and on a tangent here I love the clash of various cultures that the Terran Empire encapsulates, with grand Roman style titles but then the themes and look of sort of a China's imperial dynasty, but referring to the fatherland with obvious Nazi-like connotations. It's just a cool blend of lots of human imperial slash dictatorship facets, all rolled into one. Tangent over. Burnham gives them the slip and manages to contact the Discovery, making this a three-way conflict between the remaining imperial forces, Lorca's rebellion, and now the USS Discovery as sort of a rogue element. The firefight in the corridors was kind of cool, but it served merely to bring Lorca and George U face to face. Also, props to the one soldier who attempted to shoot the flashbang before it detonated. In so many films and shows, people simply ignore the small little device rolling towards their legs until it's too late. So, Prime Stamets plays the clarification game for the crew of the USS Discovery, now under official command of 
I guess Commander Saru, after Burnham shares her revelation with the crew. Good, so now we're all operating on the same page. Compartmentalising critical information in these types of situations often leads to reiterating plot points and it can be frustrating to watch, so I'm glad this didn't happen. Turns out that the giant orb that the Karen is hugging is a mycelial nexus of like, harnessed spore energy and it's protected by a containment shield, but a direct spore laden torpedo hit should start a chain reaction that could destroy the flying city. Next you'll tell me the shield is being projected from a nearby forest moon of Endor and that the Discovery will have to fly through the Charon to get a clear shot at it. Ah. Well, one out of two, I guess. Mind you, the Terrans would probably just get distracted and eat all the Ewoks on Endor, so... So, obviously, united by adversity, the Empress and Burnham share a moment where she realises that a common theme that unites the two in any universe is Burnham's betrayal of George Yu. Then we get lecture time with Stamets as he explains that the mission is looking to be sort of a one-way trip, but Saru rallies the crew. Without Lorca's influence, the crew can actually begin to operate as a whole in a sense, hopefully more of the explorers they signed on to be, and it turns out Saru can make a really good case. His character's story has been one of developing into a capable leader, and as of now, I can see him retaining the captain's chair. Moving back to the Karen, the plan is underway, with Burnham bringing a defeated Georgiou to the Lorca. Literally the same ploy she was just using to get to the Karen in the first place, with Lorca. Hmm, fool me once? The whole one-way trip angle doesn't last very long, as Tilly and Stamets realise they can harness the spore explosion of the Karen to gather enough energy to jump home. It'll be tricky, but they can do it. The conversation between Lorca and the Discovery crew is great, and it encapsulates the Terran view of the United Federation of Planets perfectly. He's proud of the soldiers he has forged, but he admits they would never be of high enough grade to make a truly effective killing machine, as they've been corrupted by Federation ideals. Now he's discarding them for something better, however, the strongest steel is always a blend of materials. And with Federation values, a strong moral core, honed by a Terran captain's constant training, the only thing they lacked was trust, now they seem to have found that in each other. Well this sounds like a very strong alloy to me. Then we get the second most awesome sci-fi throne room fight scene that I've seen this year, as the setup pays off. One quick criticism however, does the Karen not have shields, or is it that the spore powered torpedoes are so powerful that shields just aren't effective? Anyway, during the fight scenes where Georgiou kicks ass, hey you have Michelle Yeoh so you might as well use her, Landry is actually cut down by Lorca as she tries to kill Burnham. Wow. Lorca really has gone a bit delusional, hasn't he? He still thinks that even after all this, that things are going to work out for him. After all, he is destined to rule and therefore Burnham is destined to be by his side again. The look on his face as he gets wrecked from behind says it all. He wasn't angry, he didn't even seem in too much pain, just confused. He escaped the Empire, crossed universes, found his lover alive in another dimension commanded a vessel and made his way back to continue his coup. Surely it couldn't have been all in vain? I knew from the minute we saw that hatch open that someone was going through it. Yeah, that's a good shot. I wanted to use that as the thumbnail, but that's just way too spoilery. And black alert as we watch some awesome piloting skills with some amazing external camera work. And boom! They destroy the Karen and they go to warp. Oh hell, that is a big explosion, it is literally travelling faster than light as they try to outrun its leading edge. Oh my god, then they spore jump at warp and... Oh, that was jolly awesome! Alright, now network vision, that's kind of interesting to see. This must be what Stamets sees as he navigates the mycelial network in an instant. This time, however, he's kind of lost and it takes Colbert's advice to find the clearing in the forest. They make it home again, huzzah! Uh, however, as I mentioned in the interphasic space video, time travel can often be an unforeseen side effect of breaking through realities, and they kind of overshoot by nine months. In those nine months, the Klingons have driven the Federation seemingly all the way back to Earth, as the Discovery was unable to present its findings on the Klingon cloak to the brass due to Lorca's excursion. And let's not forget that the ISS Discovery has had unlimited access to our universe for nine months. So we're probably not done with the Mirror Universe just yet. And Burnham, why did you save Georgiou? I mean, I know why, but I don't know if she's going to forgive you.
She's a fallen empress left with nothing. A heroic death was all that she had. Her immediate supporters are gone, and she's tearing through and through. Well, I guess there's room on the ship for her too, and she can serve as proof of their adventures. She can have the cell next to Laurel. And Vok. So how are they going to fix this then? The Federation wasn't pushed back this close to losing everything from what I know of the Klingon War, but Discovery could be rewriting a few details. It now has a lot of strings to tie up to maintain continuity though. Spore drive, knowledge of the Mirror Universe pre-TOS, and now the near total collapse of the Federation. I'm just saying that as far as we know, they may still have Mud's time crystal they picked up from earlier. The uh, actual vessel that was hidden in the giant space whale, and Discovery is a ship of mostly scientific personnel. Also, are they going to run across the Mirror Discovery, or did they switch places again when they jumped back? And yes, what was with that little green spore that landed on Tilly's shoulder, hmm? Things are afoot, methinks. Or a shoulder, in this case. Anyway, with all that wrapped up, it makes a fitting end to Lorca's story, and it paves the way for a more traditional crew to face these new challenges. Of course, things still look to be dire, so I don't expect a sudden 180 into happy, campy 60s sci-fi fun. I'm just saying that perhaps we can get to see some more development from the other characters who so far seem to have played bigger roles as their Terran doppelgangers. Anywho, until next week of course, Rick here is signing out, so thanks for watching and goodbye.